Oh, Jack. Jack O'Hara. Boy, you asked me some interesting questions, my man. It's a great question, Jack. Jack, hey, it's Josh Radner. Hey there, Jack O'Hara. It's Johnny Damon. Jack, so you had questions for me. Jack O'Hara? Absolutely. This message is for Jack O'Hara. Jack, how are you? Hey, Jack. Jack, hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? What's going on, Jack? Uh, listen, man, you know, you, you, you asked me a couple questions. Broadcasting around the world, you're listening to The O Show. In the show and uh, doing your thing, I mean, you've got some pr pretty big name guests. I've seen your, your stuff, so congratulations on your success. Jack O'Hara. Much nicer guy than Conan O'Brien, with much better interviewing skills. Don't forget to share this episode on your social media. Now, let's get to it. I'm so boned. I forgot to get my girl tickets for the show tomorrow, and now it's sold out. It's her freaking birthday. Oh, dude. She's only gonna break up with you. She's definitely gonna break up with me. Should've used tick pick. Wait, what'd you say? Tick pick. Look. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? There are no hidden fees. What'd you guys think I said? Oh, tick pick. I thought you said tick pick. No hidden fees. Download today. I kind of wanted to ask you just to jump right into it because uh, you started out very young in your career I kind of wanted to see what kind of ignited your passion uh, for radio and music at, at a very young age yeah I did start out young 16 years old in Elko Nevada and one of the reasons I was able to start out so young is it was Elko Nevada yeah uh, a very small town about 8,000 people when I lived there it had one radio station Jack little tiny AM radio station, KELK 1240, the golden voice of the Silver State. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody knew everybody in a small town. So uh, the owner of the radio station was also involved in the community, knew my mom, pretty much said, send Dave down. If that's his dream, if he wants to be in radio, we'll give him a job. That's how it started. Wow. So what kind of, for you growing up, like who were some of your inspirations wanting to work in radio? Well, being in a small town, uh, our only hope of hearing big market radio was hearing what was then called Clear Channel Radio Stations. Not Clear Channel the company. That's how the company got the name. But a Clear Channel is a radio station that doesn't have interference on the same frequency and therefore can crank up their transmitter and broadcast to a larger area. Yeah. So when I was a kid living in the northeast corner of Nevada, I would literally drive up on a mountain, Jack. Th this is true. I would drive up on a mountain to get better reception, <laughs> and I would listen to stations like KFI out of Los Angeles or KRSP out of Salt Lake City or KOMA out of Oklahoma City because that's all we had. That was my only chance of hearing big market radio. We didn't have the internet. Yeah. I, I know I'm aging myself. We didn't <laughs> have cable radio. You just had to do your best to hear what you could. So those were my earliest influences. And I would sit on top of this dark mountain in a small town after my air shift, listening to these disc jockeys in these big markets and fantasizing as to what it would be like. And that was my only dream. That's what I wanted to do. And I just pursued my goals. Well, so growing up in that sense, like you said, uh, not much around you in Nevada. Did you think, um, did you like, was it music for you right away? Like, Rock music, country music, was it sports? Was it kind of all the above that you wanted to talk about? It wasn't music at all. Wow. Uh, it never has been. I, I, I've never owned a CD. I've never owned a record. Uh, I've never really bought concert tickets. I'm not a music guy. Uh, it's not that I don't respect it, and it's not that I don't love the fact that so many people enjoy it. It's just not what I do. I've always been a news, information, history, sports junkie. Uh, and to me, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to entertain. Music was just what kind of filled the time in between. Wow, interesting. Uh, so in your first, because you had a 20-year run, obviously, at 98 uh, KUPD, I mean, you kind of 
rebranded the entire station in a sense, even even today. Like, how do you think you were able to build such kind of a strong presence at a station that wasn't even known for again like being a real rock station in that sense? Well, when I first started on KUPD, it was nowhere. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the bottom-rated stations in all of Arizona, and at the time, Jack, I thought, well, wow, I'm at a disadvantage. But now, looking back on my career, I realize it was a huge advantage because it gave me the chance to bring a nowhere station to prominence. So if I would have joined a number one station at that time and we remained to have success, really, what kind of stripe is that on your sleeve? Yeah. But if you can take a nowhere station and bring it up to America's rock station of the year, that's an accomplishment. So now I look back on it and I'm just thankful for the opportunity. And how did we do it? We did it with creativity and being humble and having good people around us. Wow. And how do you think you're, because again, you said you weren't like a huge music guy, kind of used it to fill the times. How did that uh, passion kind of like evolve over time, given that you had to talk about it? Yeah. So uh, when I first moved to Arizona, I couldn't get hired by the talk radio stations because I just wasn't good enough and I didn't have that type of experience. So my only hope was getting on a music station Mm -hmm. and I didn't really care which station I got on. I just wanted a job, Jack. And KUPD was the station that happened to have an opening. So that's where I ended up. It's not that I wanted to be in rock radio or that I chose rock radio. They chose me. It was the only station that had an opening. I worked my way up and I had to learn about rock along the way. Keep in mind, from a small little cow town, I was growing up with Charlie Pride and Dolly Parton. Yeah. The Oak Ridge Boys and Kenny Rogers and (laughs) Tammy Wynette. I mean, I did have some rock experience just from listening to the stations I told you about on on the top of that mountain but other than that I really knew nothing about rock and roll and I had to learn it wow so so and again I, I listened to I think it was the Stoned Age podcast that you guys have at, at, at the networks and you were kind of talking about I think this was a year ago talking about your first experience in Nashville Tennessee my brother just moved to Nashville Tennessee with his young aspiring band hoping to gain some connections kind of work their way into the music industry kind of learn the way in a sense uh, what was your first experience there like and uh, was country music always your, your first love if anything in music well I've always you know respected music and the people who create music but I've never been a a music fan so if I'm driving along in my car for example it would never be music that I listen to I always try to listen to I I really enjoy my favorite podcast now to where I can listen on demand to anything I want to listen to without long commercial breaks I love that and first off congratulations to your brother and I wish him the very best is he in a rock or a country band he honest I think it's more of a uh, I'm trying to think like a jam band like Dave Matthews Fish stuff like that that's kind of his inspiration Nashville now has a huge rock scene. Yeah. When I went out there uh, for the first time in country radio, I ran into all of my old rock and roll friends. Wow. I ran into Kid Rock and Bon Jovi and the guys from Metallica and wow. Bob Seger, and they're all recording in Nashville. Uh, in fact, when I pretty much started in country, Bon Jovi had the number one song. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then Kid Rock did. Uh, it's just a blend anymore of rock and country coming together when you talk to a lot of rock artists you'll find out that their earliest influencers were country based and when you talk to a lot of uh, the, the country artists, you'll find that their earliest influences were rock based. You talk to Brooks and Dunn and they talk about growing up on ZZ Top, you know? Yeah. Uh, you talk to ZZ Top and they talk about being from Texas. And growing up on early country, that was their earliest influences. So it really does all blend together, and sometimes people judge too hard. Mm -hmm. Like when I left rock, you know, some people were going, oh, what a traitor, he went country. But that same week, I was lucky enough to have Glenn Fry and uh, Don Henley and Joe Walsh from the Eagles on my show. And I had had them on the show several times in the past, and I told them, I said, yeah, guys, a lot of guys are... uh, beat me up from going from rock to country and glenn fry god bless him miss him every day he said dave if the eagles were a new band today they would be considered country yeah but we're the one we're one of the most played bands ever in the history of rock radio if leonard skinner started today they would be considered a country band 
If Charlie Daniels started today, he would be considered a country band. But in 1977, he was one of the most played acts on all of rock radio all around the world. Uh, Molly Hatchet uh, would be borderline. They could be considered a country band. So it's, it, it's really a blurred line, Jack. But I enjoyed both. I enjoyed being in rock radio and country radio, not as much for the music, but more for the relationships. I mean, I mean, that's so right. The story you're telling about about the Eagles, for sure. What? And this is a question I kind of like to ask a lot of people uh, in this side of the industry. What's your overall take on like rock and country music today? Because I feel like it's taken a back seat, at least with my generation, unfortunately, to the rap and the hip hop and the pop music of the world. Why don't you think it's kind of as captivating as it was uh, back in the days, the '80s, '90s, uh, even before then? Because there's no albums, there's no thematic uh, type presentations from groups. Uh, there are very few super groups today. Yeah. We're in the 70s, 80s, even 90s. That was really the, the common ground of super groups is you would buy their whole album. That's how concept groups like Pink Floyd came about. You would buy and digest the whole album and love it and stare at the album cover. Today, the biggest groups... You download their favorite song. Yeah. They're here today, they're gone tomorrow. They're one-hit wonders. Uh, to draw big crowds, typically they have to team up in groups of ten or twelve and do festivals to try to sell tickets. Now there are a couple big super groups still around, but very few. To where in in the early uh, earlier eras of music and decades uh, of music, really there were arena bands, uh, the, the Van Halens and the Bon Jovis. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Chesney's and uh, they would uh, Garth Brooks they'd be selling out arenas uh, the Eagles uh, today it, it's you know the goal is to get downloads not right. to sell records yeah totally I, I mean what what's kind of your overall take on the the reputation of the music industry I think uh, that would be another question that my brother would probably uh, benefit from because again like from a personal side i mean you've gotten to know many of them throughout the years probably most most of them great guys but at the same time there's the business side that has the reputation for being uh, somewhat of a toxic industry what's your overall take on the reputation of the music industry as a whole well it's become that way because it's very fragmented so like yeah. your brother's band probably one of the most instrumental people you can have in a band now is somebody who truly understands technology and how to get a band's music out it used to be that record companies would have record representatives go by radio stations and try to pitch songs. That doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Today, if you want to get your music heard, you have to understand other platforms like Spotify and Google and how to be found and how to be searched and how to play the game. Uh, my, my son has a band. It's called First and Forever. And he said, Dad, I don't really want to play local shows. I said, then don't. He goes, I just want to create music. Jack, he's a finance manager. Yeah. He's a finance analyst in Scottsdale. And he said, okay. And he said, so, Dad, what do you suggest? I said, I suggest recording your very best music, investing in yourself, and trying to get it heard. So they went over to Los Angeles, and they invested some of their own money, and they had five songs made. Uh, they put it on Spotify. It blew up with a million downloads, and they got signed by a record company. Wow. I know. If you if you look them up, you'll see that they're just blowing up. If it wasn't for COVID, they'd already be on tour. And yeah. they did that. They did one show, one live show. I mean, I feel like, and I think uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters says that all the time. Like, if you want to be recognized, play live shows. Like, play live shows consistently as opposed to making something on your laptop, on your computer, using GarageBand and all these other uh, audio technicians. Because, like, that's how people are going to recognize you. Like, if you keep showing up, they're going to remember your face in a sense. Yeah, if you're going to release something, make sure it's quality. That's why... My son's band went over to L.A. and they used a great studio and they paid for it. Yeah. To, uh, and they they went in a little bit of debt to do it. And they, they got a producer that had produced other big bands from My Chemical Romance to The Used to whoever they listened to. Uh, and they did it right. So once they started releasing those tunes, it was quality. When you mentioned GarageBand and stuff, I think that has a place for people wanting to hear what they originally sound like. Yeah. Uh, but... GarageBand is almost equal to Blog Talk or Anchor. 
in in the podcast world it's hard to be taken seriously you really have to be professional it's like in our world jack and i that's podcast pretty much what i do for a living along with an agency there there are over a million podcasts in the united states but they say that only two percent are professional enough to accept revenue to accept income Uh, because so many are done out of you know basements and garages and offices and closets it's it's hard to take that serious so the bands that really want to step up and play on the pro level those are the ones that typically have a better outlook and and to go back to kind of the the radio interview side because me still trying to figure out how an interview works in in a sense you being a, a 20 plus year professional in it like how how are you able to because again uh, from the music side from uh sports side whatever you're talking about you've been able to talk and interview uh, a ton of big time celebrities and i wanted to kind of get your take on how you're able to interact with those people kind of on a personal level because obviously they're there to probably promote something or uh, talk about a certain subject but how are you able to get them to open up about other things uh than the things that they're there probably there to promote well on an interview basis my first suggestion would be to make them happy and cover their business first right pressure comes off so jack pretty much anybody that you're going to have on has something to sell they have a movie or a song or a book or they have a seminar or a speaking appearance or a comedy appearance they have something to sell that's why most of them are on with you is they want to sell a product right so you as the interviewer if you can get that out of the way first you give them a comfort zone to relax and then just have fun with you so most artists uh for example right now if i had oh name an artist dave matthews you mentioned right dave matthews on uh the first thing i would say is uh, our guest today is dave matthews he has a new album out it's available here here and here the Dave Matthews website is here and here. He also has a new book out for the holidays. It's on Amazon and Audible. And I'll remind you at the end of the interview, but right now let's talk to Dave Matthews. So then you go into the interview. Well, now you've already done his work for him and you don't have his publicist, I mean, tapping him on the shoulder going, mention the product, sell right. the book, sell the book. He can relax. You've already done the work for him and you've already mentioned that you're going to do the work for him again at the end of the interview so now he can just be dave matthews and hang out with you wow and over your years of uh expertise are there certain guys that you had great chemistry with as opposed to guys who you just didn't connect with at all and were there solely to promote the thing and really had no interest in actually having a conversation oh so many yeah you, you and i need to hang out sometimes <laughs> i will tell you that and here's a plug uh, my audio book that's free and it's out right now yep. mentions all of my favorite interviews and my least favorite interviews and why and it goes through some of the disasters and some of the incredible successes so I'll give you an example of both um, Terry Bradshaw big tough quarterback Yeah, he was on my show during a Super Bowl week promoting the Super Bowl promoting what he does on Fox and I had him in studio and he was terrific and i got all the plugs out of the way and he was happy go lucky terry singing songs and talking about crazy stuff but then at one point uh, i i said so terry uh you travel a lot and i know that you miss your family a lot your family's a big deal to you jack for some reason he felt comfortable with me and he yeah. started telling me about his many years of depression wow And then he told me about why he got on the medication. Uh, I think it's called Paxil. And he started crying. Wow. Well, now I have the toughest quarterback, one of the toughest quarterbacks of all time with whatever, four Super Bowl rings, whatever he won, crying on my show. And and we got done with the interview, and, and Terry said, I'm sorry, Dave, it's the first time I've ever done that. I said, Terry, that's a huge compliment. He goes, you just kind of inspired me to tell the story. I said, Terry, do you want me not to use the interview? He goes, no, 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 it will help other people. But here's a guy that had done millions of interviews, and for some reason I got something out of him that nobody else had ever gotten out of him. That's a success. Wow. On the disaster side, <laughs> <laughs> I've had artists walk out on me. 
I've had artists walk out on me and then walk back in on me. A good example is Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. 1997, Aerosmith came out with a book called Walk This Way. Yes. Um, a big part of that book talked about really a, a huge success of Aerosmith was overcoming drugs and having a second part of their career. If you remember, they came back in their career by doing a song with Run DMC, Walk This Way. They got hit with a young crowd again, and Aerosmith became huge again. Yeah. Where they, they were an opening act there for years. People forget. I mean, they were opening for bands like the Scorpions and stuff. Aerosmith oh, yeah. took a dive for a while. So anyway, 1997, they come in uh, to the studio, and they want to promote their book. So they sit down in my studio, and I said, okay, guys, we'll talk about how you overcame drugs, and now you have this big success. Congratulations. Steven Tyler looked right at me, and he goes, I don't want to talk about that, man. I said, what do you mean, Steven? He goes, Dave, I've been on your show a lot of times. I'm asking you. Don't bring it up. I said, Steven, I have to bring it up. It's what your book's about. He goes, I'm telling you, man, don't bring it up. I look at my clock. There's about five seconds before we go on the air, and he's pointing at me going, don't bring it up, man. So I cracked the mic and I said, Stephen, the first thing we want to talk about is how you overcame drugs mm. in 1997. Nice. <laughs> he looked at me with steel eyes. And he got up, started walking out of the studio, and there was nothing but quiet. Wow. And Joe Perry said, come on, man. Come on, Stephen. Sit down. And then he started giving the interview. So we got into the commercial break, and he looked at me, and he goes, Pratt, you got balls, man. He goes, I told you not to do that. I said, Stephen, it's my show. And he paused for a second. This is off the air during commercial break, and he goes, I like you, man. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, please, bring us on stage tonight, directly on stage. I said, Stephen, I always do. I'll be there. Uh, and it's just kind of a way of telling them that you're not trying to be disrespectful, Jack. You're you're trying to serve your audience with right. the reason that the artist is there. I mean, you're there to do your job at the end of the day. I mean, and that's that's so funny because, I mean, yes, like <laughs> you were constantly told not to do it, but at the same time, you're doing your job, and then at the end of the day, he respects you for it. At the end of the day, which I find very interesting. Yeah, and it's okay to let your audience in. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm big on examples. I, I interviewed Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani that are now a couple. Right. So before we went on the air, I've known Blake for a while. <clears throat> before we went on the air, he said, Dave, um, please don't bring up you know, my marriage to Miranda Lambert or please don't bring up Gwen's marriage to Gavin from Bush. Yeah. He said, Can we just talk about our current music? And I said, hey, I'll make you guys a deal. And I'm talking to Blake and Gwen. I said... My audience is going to expect me to bring that up. So why don't I just bring it up and you tell me that you'd rather not talk about it and then we're off and rolling because that way I was responsible for my audience. Wow. So when we opened the interview, I said, Blake, Gwen, it's so great to have you here today. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be in Arizona, blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, we've been friends for a long time and I'm just going to tell you this interview is not about previous marriages or Miranda or Gavin, this interview is about you and your music today. Fair enough? And they go, thank you so much. Then we're off to doing the interview. Wow. So, but, what you, but what you basically done is made them comfortable and you've served your audience by acknowledging the fact that you have the balls to bring it up. Oh, yeah. How often are you able to talk to your guests on that kind of level before the interviews? Well, just because I've been around since Dirt Jack, yeah. I've gotten to a lot of these people. Um, the rock days were really tough when I started because a lot of times you wouldn't even talk to the artists before they would go on. They would have their representative call and they would say, okay, Dave, Ozzy's on the line. You're going to talk to him in two minutes. When you get done, um, we'll just hang up and thank you very much. So I wouldn't even talk to the artist beforehand. The rep would just tell me, this is the name of the album. This is what you want to plug. Ozzy's on. He'll be waiting for you. And then the minute you go on the air, it's the only time you talk to him. That was it. Wow. I feel like in that prime example right there, Ozzy's a tough guy to talk to when you haven't talked to him beforehand. He's hard to understand. Yeah. But the difference is over the years, so that was the first time, right? Now, over the years, Ozzy will call and he'll go, Dave, how's Paula doing? Good, you know, and I can try to understand him mm -hmm. and we joke about it. Yeah. 
he's a big teddy bear because he knows that you've served him well and they can trust you. And, and that's, that's a big part of the game. And you're going to get to that point, Jack, when you have several good interviews, your reputation is going to get around and they're going to know that they're safe with you. There are so many people trying to make their bones by being rude to a guest or by telling them to take their top off or whatever. That's Howard Stern stuff and how he started. But Howard is so damn talented, he could get away with it. Everybody else trying to be Howard, it doesn't work for them as well. But a lot of people thought that that's how they would make their name. But it's just the opposite. Once you get respect as an interviewer, you'll find out that the artists give you respect as well. When I started in country, country's a different animal than rock. They wouldn't have record reps call. Even the A artists, like Faith Hill, she would call, David's Faith, how you doing? You know, how are the kids? Blah, blah, blah. She, you know, they're up with the chickens and they're happy. They're the yeah. nicest people in the world. But if you do a good job on that Faith Hill interview, she's going to tell Shania and she's going to tell her husband, Tim McGraw, and she's going to tell Martina McBride. And now they'll know that you're okay to to do interviews it's it's really a kind of a small world there with pros that do interviews and your reputation will get around well cross your fingers i mean that was actually gonna be my next uh, point because obviously you and stern were kind of at the top of the boards there for a while and you mentioned uh, kind of his interviewing style because you know, like I'll listen to him and everybody will listen to him and every now and then he'll ask a question he'll phrase it in a way that I feel is just like totally disrespectful and I would think like if I asked it that way I just get slapped in the face you know like like how how do you how are you able to like ask personal questions like that without you know insulting or offending people? Well, Howard can do it today because he's a bigger star than almost all of the guests that he has on his show. Yeah. So once you get that leverage, you can pretty much do whatever you want. In the early days, uh, there were three of us, Jack. There, there, Myself, Howard Stern, and a guy that you've probably never heard of. His name was The Grease Man. And wow. he was in Washington, D.C. And the three of us were the first ones to be called, uh, well, in, in those days, uh, they, they would you know, call us a different brand of radio than anybody else you know they would call it raunch and roll or they would call us shock jocks or whatever it was that's fine howard broke out because he was the first one to accept a gig to do it on a syndicated basis it wasn't yeah. that he was better or more talented he was just the first one who was willing to move to new york and do it on a syndicated basis i didn't want to move to new york you know i was recently married and i just love arizona and didn't want to go there doug the grease man was too old so howard was the first to do it and he deserves credit but it wasn't that he was this breakout talent over the years howard just got better and better and better and he became an incredible talent uh and then you know once he developed a name it it got a lot easier for him but he's a good interviewer now. Um, if you can get past all the shock stuff that he does and really listen to his interviews, he does a really good job. Have you ever heard anything from anybody that you've interviewed that he's interviewed and like just from a reputation basis? Like, did they think he was a nice guy? Was he an asshole? Like, oh, based on his interview I know skills. Too. I mean, yeah. You know, I worked with him a lot of years, and I can tell you, he's a great guy. Yeah. And I, I don't care what anybody says, and sometimes reputation can kind of get out in front of you to where people start telling stories that aren't necessarily true, and it gets to be competitive. But I can tell you personally that he's a great guy. He's very warm and very good, and he's worked very hard. Now, he sacrificed a lot to get to where he is. He sacrificed his family. So it's kind of interesting. That, yeah. You know, um, at one point, Early in my career, we were sitting on a, a panel together or something. And I said, buddy, you changed the whole culture of radio. You changed the whole game. You made more money than anybody in radio. And he said, Dave, you're, you're wealthier than I am. And I laughed. I said, yeah, right. And he goes, no. He goes, you got your whole family. He goes, you got everything. And what I think he was trying to say was that he sacrificed a hell of a lot. Yeah. I mean that. If you've seen this movie, then you know. Oh yeah, I mean that. That's a, that's a hefty price to pay uh, for yeah. wanting to have a career. I mean, it's worked out for him this point from a professional standpoint. From from a personal standpoint, I personally couldn't imagine doing that. You obviously didn't do that. 
but you know he's as authentic as he possibly can, and and it shows, and it's why he's successful. Do you, do you feel like obviously being yourself is like the number one thing you have to do at any level to be successful at anything that you want to do? But even from an on-air perspective, on a radio perspective, how important do you think it is to be yourself when interviewing these guests or just in general talking about things? Well, it depends. The- you're responsible to a couple different people. You're responsible to your audience and you're responsible to your employer. And are you putting on a show or are you being yourself? Yeah. Well, it kind of depends what your employer wants you to be. So in rock for me uh, and in country, it was kind of a blend of both. They wanted me to be the rock guy. They wanted me to be the country guy. I was the morning guy leading their station. I was their flagship. But at the same time, they wanted me to be a little bit of myself. So there was a little bit of a blend there, but there's no doubt that it was a show. I mean, rock and roll, when I would do shows with my band and all that, I already told you I'm not a music guy. That's a show. Yeah. But what's wrong with that? I mean, actors on television and movies, on Broadway, on stage, a lot of the musicians that you see, you'd be surprised they're not anything like their stage persona. It's a show. Gene Simmons doesn't walk around in makeup and go to the barber. I mean, it's it's a show. Kiss puts on a show. Yeah. Uh, that's what it is. It's show business. Uh, today, I'm blessed because I can just completely be myself. You know, I run the agency and run the podcast network and the, the video network, and I don't really have to put on a show for anybody. So it's really nice. I can just be bone honest and relax. Yeah. I mean, and to kind of allude into that, the Star Worldwide net Networks and um, agency, uh, radio, TV shows, advertising, over 225 shows, like you said. And, you know, like, given everything that you've accomplished uh, in, in the radio business, like, what, what, what's kind of your passion? Like, what sets your soul on fire with this kind of helping others create their own platforms? Yeah, well, number one, my goal has always been to support my family. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. So... Um, radio and media, as much as I love it, it's been a vehicle to feed my family, put the kids through college, yeah. and uh, have a nice life for my wife. So I'm, I'm very thankful for everything the media has given me. As far as the professional side, uh, I, I got to live my dream when I was sitting on top of that mountain, Jack. I got to do it. I, I got to you know be a radio personality for a number of years, and after a while, it just got kind of old, and radio went down, and... Uh, AM, FM radio started losing a ton of revenue and they couldn't afford their personalities anymore. And I'm not blind. I said, okay, look, instead of forcing myself to stay on the air, I feel sorry for a lot of these people that are still on the air because they don't know what else to do in life. They don't know what to do other than be on the radio. So they're kind of stuck taking whatever paycheck is given to them and that's it. I mean, they, they take the insurance, they take a 401k, they take a small check, they go on the air and that's their life. I've never wanted to do that. So 10 years ago when I saw radio starting to go down, I said, screw it. I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to be a disruptor and I'm going to start my own network, my own podcast. People thought it was nuts. Yeah. They're like, you're turning down radio offers and television offers to do what i said start my own thing so we started uh, with just my podcast and i promised my crew i said look if we can prove that we can monetize this then we'll make more within a year we had over 200 podcasts from all around the world we had crap beer shows from Belgium, travel shows from London, financial shows from Canada with the exchange of the dollar, entertainment shows from California, every show you can possibly imagine from Arizona, and it was just blowing up. So we made more and more studios, added more studios, added studios in Burbank. <laughs> it was nuts. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a lot of our podcast hosts and video hosts would say dave we love the way that you handle our business we just wish that you did more in terms of agency work we wish that you did fill in the blank media buying pr branding commercial production blah 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 and i kept recommending that to other people um giving recommendations for this type of work to my friends in the business and after a while i said screw it let's just take it all so we started an agency so now that's what we do. It's a full service network and agency that handles clients all over the world. 
So a lot of the television commercials you see, for example, those are produced by us, created by us. The media buying is done by us. Um, it's, it's fun. We, we enjoy it. I mean, it's definitely a different uh, style of pace for you. And you kind of alluded to the fact that uh, people kind of thought you were crazy leaving radio, pursuing this. And at the end of the day, it's what whatever's going to make you happy, like whatever fits best uh, in your current lifestyle. During your, your whole run in radio, did you ever feel like you battled like really bad uh, adversity? Like we talked about Howard Stern sacrificing, you know, his family, which is a, a detriment price to pay. But did you ever feel like there were times where you felt like you it was time to leave because certain things were, were not um, being uh, paid attention to as much? From company to company, I mean, at KUPD, when it originally sold... Uh, to another owner, I saw it going down because it was all corporate and yeah. it just wasn't as much fun. I mean, I cut my teeth at KUPD by beating stations like KDKB and KSLX. My job was to pound them and we did and we had a ton of success and pretty soon the same company owned all three. That was boring. My yeah. job was almost <laughs> to give up part of my audience to let the others be successful. Who wants to do that? Right. So after a while, I just said, nah, I'm out of here, and I left that. Um, I just wasn't comfortable with that whole vibe. Uh, and I wanted to do something different in my career that nobody else had ever done. I wanted to win Rock Personality of the Year, not just in rock, but I wanted to prove it. it had nothing to do with the music, and I wanted to do it in a different format where everybody said I couldn't do it. You ever had somebody tell you that you can't do something and it kind of inspires you? All the time. So everybody said, hey, you can't do country. So I did, and within two years, we were nominated at Madison Square Garden for the top yeah. country morning show of the year for the Country Music Association. I, I loved it. Um, and then when you know country and, and radio in general started to uh, struggle financially, I told everybody I was going to do my own thing again, and here we go, Jack. They said, Dave, you can't do that. Yep. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> so I've always loved being the disruptor. I've loved proving people wrong, and... Uh, that's that's what I enjoy. It inspires me. I mean, I'm the exact same way. When someone tells me that I can't do something, I want to do it and then some. Like, just bury it on, in a sense. What do you... Because, again, like you said, like, weren't a huge music guy. That wasn't your number one thing going into the industry. And now you're in the Music Hall of Fame. Is that an honor for you, or is that more of just a title for appearances? That one surprised me, Jack. Yeah. Because, you know, for the Broadcast Hall of Fame, I've always been so thankful. And I, I think back to that mountain i was sitting on in elko and it's just a warm feeling and it's something that i always wanted to accomplish and and that happened and it was it was amazing but it was part of the broadcast world and it just kind of fell in line with my career the music and entertainment side it's just hilarious that i'm in that hall of fame <laughs> because i don't really have a whole lot of interest in music i don't play any musical instruments I, I don't sing we ended up having five albums we sold more records than any band any band ever in the history of arizona uh we were playing sold out venues i mean big ones you know, coliseum uh, state fairs the tucson community arena bands were opening up for us like cheap trick and ted nugent yeah we were playing on stages with Red Hot Chili Peppers, and it was crazy. And here I was, I'm, I'm not a music guy. We were just entertaining people. And then we ended up in the Music and Entertainers Hall of Fame. My band had an offer to sign nationally and to go on tour at one point, and I just laughed at myself. <laughs> I said, I, I, it's not what I do. You know, it's, it, it, this is out of control. I started the band as a joke. And it, it ended up just blowing up. Wow. And, and from, obviously, the Broadcast Hall of Fame perspective, that one obviously held a lot more weight for you, I'm, I'm assuming. Actually, the other way. So the really? Broadcast Hall of Fame, you never assume anything, and you never get to the point where you don't appreciate something. Right. But because it was in the world of broadcast, a lot of people have been telling me over the years that it was pretty much expected, especially oh, well. because of what we've done out of Arizona. I mean, there was a time that if you wanted to be the rock personality of the year for the entire nation, you, you had to be based in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, possibly Dallas or San Francisco. You didn't do it from Phoenix. 
I mean, at that time, Phoenix was a million people in population. Yeah. You know? You just didn't, you didn't win something like that from Phoenix. It's like the first time San Antonio won an NBA championship. They're like, what? San Antonio, Texas? Uh it was kind of like that for Phoenix. So after disrupting the industry, so many people had told me, especially after turning down so many gigs in LA and New York and MTV and stuff over the years, uh, people just thought that the, the career might, might get there to the hall of fame, um, you know, level, but for music and entertainment, nobody ever expected that. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I was nominated. It was so funny. Some people, you know, we're hearing from, you know, the people that have come out of Phoenix, you know, Jim Blossom, yeah. Stevie Nicks, Alice Cooper, uh, it's Glenn Campbell. Um, it, it's just funny. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. And the fact that it catches you off guard, too, I, I totally see it from that perspective now. You know, like you, you're told years in advance, like, okay, this is probably going to happen on the radio broadcast side. But then you just get a call one day from the Music Hall of Fame and you're just kind of like, really? Are, are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, it was it, it was a little bit different, but it, it made me smile and it was great. So being uh, again on radio for as long as you have been, and not having the exact passion for music going into it over the years, how has that evolved your your passion for music as a whole? Not at all. Really, I'm still a, an information and a news and sports person. I want to know what's going on in the world. I've always had an interest in the competitive side of music and I've always understood the business, but I've never personally been into the business. If I have my own time, I never listen to music. I'll give you an example. Like when I'm working out, I'll listen to my favorite podcast. Wow. I, just, okay. I, I don't listen to music, but, but I, I've always appreciated those that do enjoy music because they've given me a living and I certainly understand how they would love music. Everybody does. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful release for people for so many reasons. I have so many friends in the music business. I'm proud of my son. Um, so I totally get that. And I definitely respect those who have made it the music business because I know how hard they've worked. Now, being, of course, in the Valley of the Sun for as many years as you have now, again, growing up in Nevada, but being in Arizona for as long as you have been, uh, from a sports side, what was it like um, in those early years, obviously, when the Diamondbacks were established and the Suns were in the NBA Finals? Like, What was the whole Phoenix scene like then? Uh, you know what, Jack? It's been a great ride all the way, and you know, I think you know Gonzo's my best buddy, right? Right. So uh, seeing him have success was truly fun and sharing that success with his family because our families are very close was really uh, something memorable on a personal side on a non-personal side from the minute I moved here I mean I have been a Suns fan even before I moved here I was a huge Suns fan uh, between Walter Davis and Alvin Adams and uh, Paul Westfall and Connie Hawkins, my all-time favorite player, before I even got to Phoenix, I was a huge Suns fan. And at that time, uh, when I moved down here in, in 1979, 1980, the Suns were the only pro sports team in town. It was ASU and the Suns. That was it. Wow. So went to every game, loved it. Uh, and then as the Valley developed, I mean, once we got – the Coyotes and the Cardinals, and then after that, the Diamondbacks. It it just became so exciting, and I'm such a huge sports fan. Uh, and all the Arizona teams, of course, those are all my favorites. Yeah, uh, and gotten to know a lot of the guys over the years, and you know, been able to be involved with the teams, and it's fun. We still do the commercials today. Um, our network does all the commercials for the Phoenix Suns. We do. Um, a lot of the commercials and stuff for the Diamondbacks, and we, we enjoy it. Who, uh, obviously, baseball, football, whatever, what was your, your favorite sport growing up? Basketball. Basketball. I played baseball and basketball. I yeah. was a hack. <laughs> I, was a, I mean, I was okay. It's a small town. Come on, anybody can. In the same boat. Team in yep. Elko, Nevada, right? Um, but it, it was fun, and I loved it. I loved the camaraderie. I was okay. I, mean, yeah, I was a, a great athlete, but I was okay. I was good enough to play on the teams, and it just gave me a true love for sports. And then that's got to be a thrilling thing when they announced the Diamondbacks in 97, 98, kind of as an expansion team, because who, who were you rooting for from a baseball perspective at that point? Because, again, like they were the last expansion team to come in back in 98. 
Well, my favorite player of all time, people give me a hard time about it, was Pete Rose. Uh, so I always grew up a, a huge Cincinnati Reds fan, big red machine, probably because so many people in my small town cheered for the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've always been a big red machine fan, football-wise. Don't ask me why, but I always loved the Redskins, always enjoyed them yeah. growing up. Uh, and I, I can't really tell you why. I just... I, I always did. It's not like my parents were Redskins fans yeah. or anything. I just, I don't know why. I just always enjoyed them growing up. Um, hockey, I mean, growing up in a small town of Elko, I would take anything I could get. I've always loved hockey, always loved it. Uh, and any game that we could possibly get, I would just watch. I've always just adored the sport. Uh, and, and, you know, basketball, Suns fan all the way yeah. from day one. Yeah. I mean, you just get drawn to teams. I'm I'm from New Jersey. I go to school right now in Phoenix, and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I know that there's a lot of Cowboys and Steelers fans all over the place, but uh, you just get drawn to a team, and then you fall in love with them. What was that like for you? I mean, in an area where the Giants <laughs> are king, and they hate the Cowboys, and here you are, a Cowboys fan? Well, th- th- it's a funny story, actually. I was like seven, eight, nine years old. I kind of forget, but yes, growing up in northern New Jersey, my entire family, New York Giants fans, and the Giants and Cowboys were playing, and for whatever reason, seven-year-old kid, I probably did something wrong, but I didn't take it that way. Me and my dad got into a big fight, you know, um, and at that point, I'm just, like, really angry at him, and the Cowboys won game-winning field goal, I think it was. I can't remember the year, 07, 08, somewhere along those lines, but he was really pissed off, and I just really took a lot of uh, satisfaction in that, and ever since, I have been a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I mean, and that's that's the the true story. I mean, we laugh about it today, and every time we get together and watch a game, that that's what we tell people. You know, for years uh, here, Emmett Smith was a member of my show, and he would come on once a week and just have some fun with me. I still see him once in a while, but he would tell me that playing in Dallas was unbelievable. I mean, when you play in Dallas, it's a religion. Um, he would go out and never buy a lunch. I mean, you couldn't. You're Emmett Smith. Uh, wherever he went, he just felt so loved the whole time because in Dallas, the Cowboys, they truly are a religion. Yeah. And he was just kind of, uh, and Danny White uh, has told me the same thing before Emmett. Of course, he was quarterback with Dallas and uh, through a lot of the glory years, and he's told me the same thing several times. Wow, that's so interesting. I mean, and I don't want to take too much of your time. I, I have uh, a couple of more things that I kind of wanted to pick your brain about, and I'm, I'm sure we could do this again and set this up again sometime because, I, again, I have a ton of things that I'd love to discuss. But uh, what do you think, from a radio perspective, we t- kind of talked about the, the technical things from a radio broadcast, being yourself, how to formulate an interview, how to have a conversation with someone, but what do you think makes a specific show stand out in a way, aside from, you know, having like one specific thing that you focus on? Well, I think it has to be packaged professionally. Um, you have to have good custom imaging. Yeah. Not just when you're on the air, but when you're promoting the show. And today, I think promoting the show is just as important as the show itself. So to have a successful podcast, the podcast has to be good. The food has to be good when you get in the restaurant. Oh, yeah. But you have to promote the fact that the podcast is there because you won't have any drive-by random listening. It used to be that somebody could just hop in a rental car at Sky Harbor, they turn it on, and whatever radio station is on, that's what they're listening to. It doesn't happen with podcasts. It's destination listening. So you have to constantly remind people that the show is on and promote it strategically to let them know it's on. Once they get to the podcast, the show has to be good enough to sustain them as a fan over a long period of time. So my suggestion would be to put as much effort into promoting the show as actually doing the show and make sure that both are damn good. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can totally preach that. And, and the last thing I wanted to ask you about, I like asking... Most of my guests this question because I think it's probably the most important thing. We kind of talked about you um, uh, wanting to switch uh, lanes, kind of switch gears into uh, the agency side and the network side as opposed to radio. And, you know, like being a father as well, uh, I guess my general question is how, how have you been able to balance, you know, family and work and at the same time just being overall satisfied and happy with yourself at the end of the day? Well, I think the key in life is truly loving what you do and having good people around you. 
So once I started my own network, I was in charge of who we would have on staff. That was a big deal because in corporate radio, you didn't get to choose who you work with. So number one, I wanted to work with really good people and people who I trusted. So every day, the culture of our network is off the charts, Jack. Everybody's happy. They're helping each other. They're having fun. Nobody has titles. Everybody just helps everybody. Yeah. And when you come down for a visit, you'll you'll get that vibe. Everybody helps everybody, and that's the way it should be. If anybody ever, you know, causes any turbulence or problems, they're out because we're a, we're a happy network. So I love doing that. As far as being happy in my everyday life, because I have good people around me, it allows me to set my own schedule and work in the way that I want to work. I enjoy working out of my house. Although we have three beautiful studios and offices, I get out of the way. I work out of my house and I pretty much, you know, control the orchestra from here, which is fine. But yet I can go to the studios anytime I want, of course, and do my own show or help people. Uh, The other part of life is helping people. And again, not to be cliche, but you truly get more out of doing something for somebody else than you do yourself. And for years, my job was to promote my own show. And I enjoyed it. And I loved it. But now when I see other people come on our network and have success, at first they have anxiety. Maybe they've never hosted a show. Maybe they have hosted a show, but they haven't had success. Maybe it's the first time they could ever monetize their show. Maybe they become a better interviewer. We hit certain goals together. To see them shine, it's really rewarding. I love it. I, I truly enjoy that. I mean, that, that that's so true. I mean, how how early on did you think that, um, you know, going about certain things that way and like everybody helping everybody, nobody's bigger than anybody else, nobody's better than anybody else in a sense. It's all about what you do, how ambitious you are with your goals. How how early on were you, did you know that you were kind of really good at uh, building those connections, building friendships, relationships, networking with everybody in a sense? Because I know, especially with my generation, it, it, a lot of people don't get it. Yeah. Well, the minute I started the company, I wanted it to be that way because I remember being in corporate radio and some people would come in and they'd almost be ducking like they're waiting for a bomb to hit. You know, every day they had some, you know, corporate monkey looking over them yeah. in a suit and tie wanting them to be somebody that they don't want to be and they weren't happy and that would come out on the air. I wanted just the opposite culture. Like in, in our studios, nobody's ever allowed to call me boss unless they're having fun with me i'm just dave yeah they call me the mayor if they want to have some fun <laughs> with me but nobody is above anybody else everybody helps if we have i'll give you an example jack and it, it comes by really demonstrating that you're in it with everybody else if we have a huge mixer in our studio we do those once in a while for clients and so we have a hundred people in there and they're having food and drinks and enjoying themselves for the presentation once they leave i don't leave with them i stick around with my crew and whatever we eat leftover food i help them clean up i take the garbage i I do it right with them We, we don't have a structure where one person is above another we all help each other i mean that that's i mean i love that that that's an awesome atmosphere to have and in the long run I mean, if everybody's happy, it, it's a great atmosphere, and at the same time, it's going to result in great success. So, uh, Dave, I want to thank you for being gracious enough to take almost an hour out of your Monday morning to talk to me. Uh, hopefully, we could set up another time to talk. I'd love to visit the studio sometime as well, and uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Hey, congrats to you, Jack. Thanks for having me. And my offer is open, whether it's uh, this month or, or after the new year. You just tag me. Let me know when you want to come visit. It would be a pleasure to show you around. I'm so boned. I forgot to get my girl tickets for the show tomorrow, and now it's sold out. It's her freaking birthday. Oh, dude. She's definitely going to break up with you. She's definitely going to break up with me. Should have used TickPick. Wait, what'd you say? TickPick. Look. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? There are no hidden fees. What'd you guys think I said? Oh, TickPick. I thought you said... TickPick. No hidden fees. Download today.